In 1851, American novelist Herman Melville's classic work of literature, Moby Dick, was published. The story detailing the epic seafaring cat and mouse game between the illustrious Captain Ahab and a formidable megalithic whale. And while the story may seem larger than life, and the chances of it ever occurring only the figmentations of an imaginative author, Melville in fact based his novel on true events that occurred just thirty years prior. A grisly, true test of will and character, with unimaginable consequences. A tale presumably too grim for Melville when penning his swashbuckling adventure for fans of fiction storytelling. This was the Essex ordeal, a true horror in history. In August 1819, the Essex departed Nantucket with 21 men aboard for an expected two-and-a-half-year voyage hunting whale off the west coast of South America. Just two days after setting sail, the ship was pummeled by a rough storm in the Gulf Stream, nearly sinking. A number of her sails were shredded and the ship lost two whaling boats, smaller vessels used for harpooning the whales once spotted. Despite the setback, the captain, 29-year-old George Pollard Jr., decided to press on with the voyage, ignoring the damaged sails and the missing whaleboats. In September, the Essex set a course 3,000 miles southwest for unknown waters, finding no signs of whale at their intended hunting grounds. Arriving at the new location in October, the desperate whalers initially saw little action amidst the rolling swells of the South Pacific, now thousands of miles west of the South American coast. Tempers began to flare aboard the ship, especially between the captain and his first mate, Owen Chase, six years Pollard's junior, a native of Nantucket, his ambitions for a naval career as vast as the seas he sailed upon. It wasn't until November that the first whale was spotted. The hunt was on. By late November, the whale hunt was taking its toll on the ship's whaleboats, and Owen Chase was spending his day aboard the Essex making repairs on the damages. It was then that something unusual caught his eye. A massive bull sperm whale, around 85 feet in length, nearly the size of the Essex herself, and it was coming straight at her. The whale tore through the waters, diving shallow to pick up speed before ramming into the Essex port side the large ship rocking to and fro from the impact. Shocked, Chase dashed across the deck, finding the whale had emerged on the starboard side, stunned as it floated to the surface alongside the hull. The whale quickly recovered and swam several hundred yards past the ship's bow before turning and charging again, this time striking the bow head-on with a huge crash, the timbers giving way. And as quickly as the whale appeared, it was gone as the sea rushed into the ship's lower decks. The Essex was going down. Time was now critical, as first mate Owen Chase and the few sailors on board scrambled through the ship, gathering up crucial food and items such as the navigation instruments and rigging for the remaining whaleboat. It was at this point that Captain Pollard was returning from the day's hunt, utterly taken aback by the sight, demanding to know from his first mate the cause of such calamity. Owen Chase responded, Sir, we have been stoved by a whale. The situation stood at 20 men spread out between three whaleboats, now adrift over 2,000 miles west of the South American coast. Captain Pollard decided that he and his men should make for the Marquesas Islands, 1,200 miles to the west a group of volcanic islands in the South Pacific. Chase led the crew in voting down this decision for fears of cannibal inhabitants, a grim irony that would haunt them in the weeks to come. And so instead, the crew decided to sail over 1,000 miles south, where they could catch the westerly trade winds to sail another few thousand miles to the east to reach South America. In mid-December, land was spotted, called Henderson Island, though it was largely barren. Still, the men remained there for a week, depleting what few resources the island had to offer, before deciding to press on, 
three crew members intending to stay behind rather than brave the open ocean again. By the new year, the seabound survivors were becoming very poorly. Second mate Matthew Joy suffered a health condition he brought with him onto the Essex, and on January 10th, he was the first to die. As was customary, Joy was sewn into his clothing and buried at sea. His whaleboat was commandeered by Nantucket native Obed Hendricks. The situation only got worse when the following day, Owen Chase's boat was separated from the group during a squall and was lost. Now isolated from the others, Chase and his men lost another crew member on February 8th. The night before, the man had gone mad and began convulsing and was dead the following morning. With no food left on board, and after a terrible discussion, the decision was made to quarter the man and eat his flesh and organs to survive. In late January, Hendrick's whaleboat drifted off over the horizon. The three men on board were never seen again, presumed dead at sea. The situation on Pollard's boat became dire, with no food remaining and the men at their wit's end with starvation. It was decided that a sacrifice was needed to ensure the survival of the remaining crew members. One of the survivors on board was 18-year-old Owen Coffin, Captain Pollard's first cousin, of whom he had promised to his aunt he would look after on the voyage. The crew decided to draw lots over who would be the sacrifice. Coffin drew the dreaded short straw. Pollard instantly protested, going so far as to proclaim that he would shoot any that so much as touched his kin but Coffin gallantly urged the captain to honor the outcome. And so, Owen Coffin was shot, and his body consumed. On February 18th, three months after the Essex was sunk by a massive sperm whale, Owen Chase, Benjamin Lawrence, and 14-year-old cabin boy Thomas Nickerson were rescued by a British ship. On February 23rd, a Nantucket whale ship, the Dauphin, pulled up alongside a lone whaleboat containing a completely despondent George Pollard and Charles Ramsdell, a teenage deckhand who saw the Essex voyage as a chance of adventure and the start of a seafaring career. He was also Owen Coffin's friend and was the one to pull the trigger during Coffin's sacrifice. In the bottom of their boat, the two survivors were surrounded by the bones of their fellow crewmen. They began stuffing them in their pockets as they were brought aboard, and crew members recalled seeing Pollard and Ramsdell continuing to suck the marrow from the skeletal remains as they wandered the Dauphin's deck. The survivors of the Essex would carry the harrowing experience with them in different ways for the rest of their lives. George Pollard went on to captain a new ship, the two brothers, just months after his rescue, that voyage too ending in disaster, with the ship running aground against a coral reef off the coast of the Hawaiian Islands. This second disastrous voyage effectively ended Pollard's naval career, and he returned home to Nantucket, where he served as a night watchman. His aunt, Nancy Coffin, never forgave Pollard for what happened to her son, Owen. The bereaved captain would commemorate the anniversary of the Essex disaster each year by locking himself in his room and fasting in memory of those that were lost. First mate Owen Chase went on to have a long and prosperous career aboard a number of ships, even returning at one point to the very area the Essex had gone down in another whaling voyage, although he would go on to arguably suffer the most from his traumatic past, the memories of the Essex tormenting him with persistent headaches and nightmares. He was known to hoard food in the attic of his Nantucket house, and was eventually institutionalized in a hospital where he died in 1869. Charles Ramsdale, friend to Owen Coffin, also carried on with his naval aspirations, though guilt weighed heavily on him as he struggled with himself over the things he did to survive. It was on a fateful voyage aboard a whaling vessel in November 1822, joined by a missionary group bound for Honolulu, that Ramsdale conversed with some of the missionaries, ultimately finding God and religion in his search for healing. Cabin boy Thomas Nickerson would go on to obtain his own position of captain aboard a merchant ship, and in 1876, 56 years after his survival experience, Nickerson wrote an 80-page manuscript which would sit untouched until 1960, when it was authenticated and finally published in 1984, titled The Loss of the Ship Essex, Sunk by a Whale and the Ordeal of the Crew in Open Boats. 
In addition to those rescued from the open ocean, a vessel was dispatched in April 1821 back to Henderson Island, where the remaining Essex survivors had chosen to stay. There, rescuers found William Wright, Seth Weeks, and Thomas Chapel, remarkably still alive. The act of cannibalism in the face of starvation was an understood necessity in society during the time of the Essex crew, given the very real risks of being stranded at sea. When the survivors returned home, they were not met with judgment or disdain when being welcomed back to their families, though not all spoke the whole truth of what had occurred during those grueling few months in the boats. In the dark depths the survivors of the Essex went to in order to survive their perilous situation certainly wasn't the first time in history human beings have consumed the flesh of their own species during survival situations, potentially more well-known examples being that of the Donner Party or the citizens of Leningrad during World War II. Topics we could also cover here at Horrors and History, so let us know in the comments if you would like to see these stories of survival or any others not mentioned as well. But it was the events following the sinking of the Essex by a monstrous whale that inspired and moved so many, such as Moby Dick author Herman Melville, to shed light on the incredible story of the survivors, elevating it to near-legendary status, making the Essex ordeal a true horror in history. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more videos like this one. Many views on our channel are from those unsubscribed, so please feel free to subscribe today. Thanks for watching Horrors and History.